بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اسدار تنگو حاضری پروفیسر حشم کمالی ڈاکٹر ازام تنسری جوہا صحبت صحبت پر حضرین یا بودی من السلام علیکم سلام سجاترہ پیس بی بی تیو I am here as a commentator, so I won't be making a speech as such. And I'm really happy to be able to do this brief commentary on Professor Michel Chosidovsky's presentation. We share very similar views on a variety of international issues. We support each other. We reinforce each other's position. I am privileged to be able to play host to him this week that he is in Malaysia because uh, Prof. Chosidovsky is one of those persons who I think has been honest, sincere and committed to this vision of a more just world, which is the reason why I think individuals like him deserve to be supported in their struggle. Now in my brief comments, I shall touch on five points. Number one, it is so important for people to recognize every citizen on earth to recognize that one of the most powerful trends in international politics is hegemony. If we don't recognize this, it means we have not understood international politics at all. Hegemony is a major, major factor in international politics. The search, the quest for dominance, for control. It has been there right through history in different forms. But if you don't recognize hegemony for what it is and how it impacts in today's world and try to understand international politics, including regional bilateral ties from other perspectives, somehow trying to ignore or downplay hegemony, I think we are just fooling ourselves. Recognize this as a very, very powerful force. Control, dominance by the few over the many, by the powerful over the less powerful and the powerless. That is a fact of international politics and that must be part of our analysis and understanding of what is happening around us. Hegemony has many dimensions to it. The military dimension, which has figured prominently in uh, Michelle's presentation, and which is important. That's one important dimension, military hegemony. But there are many other dimensions. There's the political dimension to hegemony. There's the economic dimension, with special emphasis upon the financial aspects of hegemony, the role of the dollar. There's the media dimension. There is the educational dimension of hegemony. Universities, research institutes, think tanks, is also part of hegemony. There is the cultural dimension. There's the technological dimension. There are other dimensions, but it is a complex phenomenon that confronts us, and we must understand that. In the ultimate analysis, it is control over our minds, how we think how we see the world. It is linked to the phenomenon of the captive mind, which my teacher, the late Professor Said Hussein Alatas, talked about very often. The captive mind, that is at the root of hegemony. The captive mind. 
and our tendency to sort of go along with the powerful because it's much easier to do that. It's part of the consequence of captivity. We just don't want to question, to challenge the dominant structures of power and control. There are reasons why hegemony is such a powerful challenge. Hegemony is connected with uh, the, the desire to control, to be dominant, to be powerful, that itself is a reason that one wants to control, one wants to dominate. You see it in uh, relations between human beings, husband and wife, and the family, but at the global level, this is real. The, just the desire to be right at the top, to be in total control, to be powerful. It's also related to resources, oil, which uh, Michelle talked about at some length, and other resources, wanting to control these resources. It's related to strategic routes, which is very important. I think it is significant, just as uh, Michelle talked about uh, 60 to 70% of uh, oil that is exported. It runs under the feet of uh, Muslims, so to speak. Likewise, with strategic routes, eight out of the 10 most important strategic routes in the world, Suez Canal, Hormuz, Red Sea, Straits of Malacca, eight out of ten are linked to Muslim countries, strategic routes. And it is also related, apart from all this, power in itself, economic resources, strategic routes. It's also related since 1948, more so perhaps after 1967, it is also related to Israel. Hegemony is related to Israel, and that I think is a very, very important factor to keep in mind. In other words, the US seeks dominance and control, especially over West Asia, because it sees itself as the protector and the benefactor of Israel. And Israel wants hegemony to continue because it sees hegemony as the guarantee for its security. And that is its singular obsession, is security. And how do you guarantee the security of a people who were without a homeland for, as they put it, for 3,000 years? You want to secure your position and you need a powerful state a force to protect you, to guarantee your security. So that's part of hegemony for Israel, for the United States of America. The reason why this has been playing in my mind is, you know, I was reading an article uh, just uh, this morning about uh, the Trump-Putin meeting and how apparently, according to Trump, endorsed to some extent by Putin. Both of them said that uh, they would be protecting Israel. They would be protecting Israel. I won't go into that. It's a very complex issue, but we will perhaps talk about it at some other point. But nonetheless, you see this whole thing about Israel and its own notion of itself as a state, as a people, and the way in which the United States and other Western countries have seen Israel. It has been a dominant factor in world politics. You can't run away from that. Now that brings me to the second point I want to make very quickly. That hegemonic power and that pattern is declining. I think that's an important point to keep in mind too. Yes, there's hegemony. There are reasons for hegemony. It is declining. And because it's declining, we are faced with numerous crisis, multiple crises because that hegemonic power that has dominated the world, especially after the Second World War, but also before that, for quite a long while, perhaps 200 years, that hegemonic power centered around the West, United States at the helm at this moment, that power is declining. 
And that is one of the reasons why we are seeing crisis in different parts of the world. Because we have come to realize that the hegemonic power that is in decline is far more dangerous than a hegemonic power that is at its apex. When it's at, at its apex, there's a certain degree of comfort. When it's declining, it becomes desperate. It becomes angry and it becomes fierce and aggressive which is what we are witnessing now. That hegemonic pattern is in decline, hence this aggressiveness that you see in different areas. Michelle talked about uh, nuclear weapons, the new developments and so on. That is part of that aggressiveness. Wanting to control, of course, you're not prepared to go to war as such, but you foster, you help create wars in different parts of the world. You may not be directly involved in terms of actual fighting on the ground, but that's part of the digression. You become very aggressive because you can see the power slipping from your hands. So you become aggressive in order to perpetuate your power. You become more aggressive. Like some of the postures which uh, Obama took in his so-called pivot to Asia. Aggressive which in turn had a reaction from China. And now you're beginning to see that whole thing play out in this region. And if you look at uh, West Asia, again, aggression vis-a-vis -vis Syria. And now you see the consequences. You look at, of course, what happened in Iraq before that 2003, there's aggression. So you have this phenomenon of greater aggression because you're in decline, you become more aggressive. And you see it from another perspective, the economic trade dimension of hegemony. And you see what Trump is doing. Now Trump, a different approach in some respects as far as hegemonic power is concerned, but look at what he is trying to do in the name of making America great. The trade wars, which he has engineered these trade wars, arguing that uh, the U.S. has been bullied all along, that it has been the victim of unfair trade practices, that he has to restore parity in trade and all the rest of it. But basically, it is an attempt to scuttle free and more important fair trade so that the United States would be able to perpetuate its economic dominance. Again, a power in decline. It knows that it cannot compete with China. It just cannot compete with China. So what it does is to employ tactics of the sort. And that brings me to uh, the third point that I want to make. If you look at Hegemony, its decline, the United States aware of what it means and reacting to this in a situation. I think the United States in particular has become very concerned about two nations in the world, which is where the whole question of war comes in. Will it lead to war? And what are the two nations? One, Russia. Russia is seen as a challenge to American military power. And it's true, if you look at the new generation of weapons and uh, developments that have taken place as far as weaponry is concerned, what Russia has done, and Russia has made this public, its uh, new prowess in the military sphere, nuclear weapons, missiles, and all the rest of it, the United States is worried that Russia has the potential, the strength, to confront the United States of America as far as its military power is concerned. This is not the Russia of Yeltsin. It's a different Russia, the Russia of Vladimir Putin. Wants to restore, I think there's a certain sense of pride, wants to restore what he legitimately feels is uh, 
the role that Russia played in the past. And of course, Russia has sacrificed a great deal for the sort of world that evolved after the Second World War. Look at the huge sacrifices that the Russians made in the Second World War. So he looks at Russia, its humiliation after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of uh, the so-called Cold War. He wants to restore the thing, pride, strength. And he has developed this weaponry to confront the United States, perhaps any other power that wants to take on Russia. So there's one dimension. The superpower, the hegemon in decline, the rise of Russia. Effective challenge to the military power of the United States of America. And then you have another dimension to it. China. China challenging the economic power, the power of uh, the United States of America. All this while, the dominant world economy in terms of trade, investments, in terms of technology and so on. Forget about all the other aspects of uh, economic power. Look at China's rise in terms of its science and technology. It is just phenomenal. A huge portion of scientific papers, new inventions and so on, actually coming from China. And uh, the scientific and technological basis of economic power, that's something that uh, one should be aware of. The Chinese have arrived as a world power in terms of economics, science, technology. And they are challenged to the United States of America. It is irreversible. There's nothing that the United States can do to reverse this. So this is yet another factor we have to keep in mind. Russia, a challenge to US's military power. China, a much more formidable challenge to American economic power. And add to this, and these are the two major actors, huh, friends, but add to this other countries which have sought to resist hegemony. And we must mention them, even if it is just a way of paying tribute to them. I always mention, whenever I talk about resistance to hegemony, I talk about Cuba. Cuba, I think, is such a proud example of resistance to hegemony. 11 million people and what it had done over the decades, the achievements, its successes in resisting hegemony to a limited extent, Venezuela, especially under Hugo Chavez. Countries like Nicaragua, Chile at one point, it has been there for the last so many decades, resistance to hegemony. And then of course, if you look at uh, West Asia, I would regard the Palestinian people as an outstanding example of resistance to dominance in hegemony. Often, marginalized, isolated, betrayed by the Arab friends, governments, even the people, but they have stood up and they have resisted. They paid a huge price, but they would be amongst the individuals who have proudly, defiantly stood up against hegemonic power, the Palestinians and others. Iraqis, the Syrians, the people in Yemen, all those places, some of the countries that Michelle had already mentioned. And in the past, if you look at West Asia, Egypt under Gamal Nasser was an important resistor to hegemony. Until, of course, after his time, it succumbed. But people have resisted. And if you look at uh, Asia, one could argue that uh, India at one time, when it led the non-aligned movement, the role it played under Jawaharlal Nehru and um, some years later under his daughter, Indra Gandhi, as a spokesperson for resistance against hegemony. 
not wanting to be a camp follower, just a obsequious, servile, supine follower of Western power, or for that matter, Russian power. That was the position that Nehru took. It was also the position that Indira Gandhi took at one time. Of course, things have changed a great deal today. And today again, if you look at uh, how fluid the situation is, you have a country like Pakistan. At the height of the Cold War, very much part of the US camp, of the Western camp. But if you look at Pakistan today, and not just uh, segments of Pakistani civil society, which is very vocal, but also the Pakistani military, much more conscious of its independence, closer ties with China. And uh, playing its role in trying to stand up for independence and autonomy. At one time in our region, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and again we have to record this. As I said a while ago, this is paying tribute to, to those who stood up. We had a Sukarno in Indonesia, one of the earliest to resist hegemony. One of the earliest to resist hegemony was Sukarno. He conceived of hegemony, imperialism, the new forces in such a comprehensive manner. Of course, he was not able to do much, but nonetheless, he was an important resistor at one point. Vietnam at a certain point. Cambodia under Norodom Sihanouk at a certain point. All these were the resistors, and I think we have to record this. So resistance is also a part of international politics and it's an important dimension, resisting hegemony. It has happened right through. And that brings me to the fourth point I want to make. Now today, that resistance, which we saw in terms of individual countries that I've mentioned a while ago, that resistance is another dimension which I think is very significant. It is the way countries are coming together to resist. One could argue that uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative, OBOR, OBOR, which has got a certain meaning in the national language, in our national language, it is a flame, OBOR. It is resistance. It is, in fact, a brilliantly conceived form of resistance against dominance. If you look at what it means, we don't know whether it will succeed, but it has potential. Massive global cooperation in terms of infrastructure development and investment. Not through the force of arms, not through conquest, military conquest, a different form of articulating an alternative. And that idea is also linked to the AIIB, the Asia Investment Industrial Bank, again part of investment development. And the Shanghai Cooperation body, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, started off small, but it's undoubtedly an attempt at strengthening military cooperation. Russia and China, they're both there. I've described the Russia-China link in recent times as the most important link in bilateral ties, which may change the world. But they're there working together in various areas, but this link is very important. Now both Pakistan and India have become part of SEO. And there are other countries. Iran has got observer status as far as SEO is concerned. And then you've got those countries that are part of Eurasia. And that project itself is part of the resistance, the Eurasia project, which involves Russia, of course, and a number of other countries in that region, including Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and so on. And in Latin America, don't forget, especially when Chavez was alive, CELAC, a sort of loose cooperation, Latin American countries and the Caribbean, and ALBA. ALBA was something which was more tangible, again, initiated by both Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. So you have resistance taking a different form. It's regional, it has gone beyond the individual nation state, 
they are standing up to dominance. The dominance that is that's very much part of international politics. The point I want to make, friends, is that um, while we analyze hegemony and power, those of us who yearn for a more just, compassionate world, we should also look at the other side. The signs of resistance, of change, of uh, attempts to articulate a different vision. And I want to end, and this is my fifth and final point, by arguing that that vision of an alternative, it will not work. It will not work unless it has a strong spiritual, moral foundation, which is different from the foundation on which the dominant forces have built their edifice. It has to be different. Why is this important? People thought from the 19th century onwards that somehow communism with its Marxist philosophy would be an alternative to capitalism. One of the reasons why it failed, it is very complex why it failed, but one of the reasons why it failed, and I've argued this, and this is by no means a new argument, many others have also argued. One of the reasons why it failed was because the underlying foundation from which Marxism arose, out of which the communist state was constructed, it was still the same materialistic worldview that had informed capitalism. The same materialistic worldview. A different way of approaching the situation of the human being, the reality is confronting the human being in one sense, but nonetheless it is the same larger vision. Two sides of the same coin, as some people had put it, including those who were once Marxist, dissolution of Marxism, you know, the God that failed. Remember that book? And the people who were part of it. It was the same thing in the end. And this is why it didn't work. What I'm suggesting, friends, is we need something else, something different, a spiritual, moral vision of the human being, which has a totally different construct. And that is a construct which you would find within all the great religions. But I won't call it a religious construct, because I don't think a religious construct, construct will work either. It's not going to work. It is a spiritual, moral, vision, the essence of uh, what it is to be a human being, what the purpose of life is, what this transient life means in relation to the whole of human creation. It's a different vision. It is a vision which is ancient and yet modern. It's ancient because it has been there in the Zoroastrian faith, in various strains of Hinduism, right up to religions like Islam. It has been there. But nonetheless, it is something which has to become the basis of a transformation. It has not happened in history. It has not happened in history. This, I think, is the...